it's a place of sudden and violent sandstorms. But today, we'll see it torn apart by a different kind of storm. We engage them with tightening gun rounds. You see the explosions going off. I dropped down inside. I looked through my commander's sight. I was finally impressed with the enemy. The US 2nd Armored Cavalry is on a collision course with the Tawakalna Division of Iraq's Republican Guard. They see themselves being great warriors who are expected to stand and fight and even die so that others may live. Two tank armies clash on a remote strip of desert. This is the Battle of 73 Easting, armored warfare at its most intense. This probably was the last great tank battle of the 20th century. February 24th, 1991. American tanks roll across the Saudi Arabian desert toward the Iraq border. They're part of a multinational force with a clear and simple mission, to drive Saddam Hussein's Iraqi army out of Kuwait. the Iran-Iraq war, Saddam has two problems. He has a great big military with nothing really for it to do. The other problem he has is that he has devastated Iraq's economy as a result of the Iran-Iraq war. And so when you're Saddam Hussein and you need money, when you need it, you do what comes natural. You rob the piggy bank next door. And in this case, that piggy bank was Kuwait. Iraqi armor and infantry overrun the oil-rich emirate in just 36 hours. Saddam ignores the United Nations' demand for an immediate withdrawal. And the UN sends an American-led coalition of 620,000 to show him they mean business. Saddam realized that he was in a bit over his head. But in Saddam's mind, the great weakness of the United States was in their inability to take casualties. They assumed that it would be very much like the Iran-Iraq war. It would be a slugging fest between these two sides, and that in the end, the Americans would cry uncle first. And so the strategy that Saddam lays out is designed to cause the most casualties to the United States while absorbing the least damage to his own forces. He dug in the biggest share of the Iraqi army, 51 of 66 divisions, and he dug them in deep. Saddam deploys 16 infantry divisions and two armored corps along the Saudi border to absorb the brunt of the coalition attack. He holds his best fighters in reserve, eight divisions of the Republican Guard, 1,000 tanks and 120,000 men are poised to strike a massive counterattack and inflict devastating casualties on the advancing coalition. The scheme for defending Kuwait that they actually employed was really the only one that was available to them. And the problem that they had was that the coalition wasn't going to play by their rules. They don't believe that it's possible for the coalition to move any further to the west. It is trackless desert out there, and the Iraqis didn't believe that the Americans could possibly move any further west than that, because the Iraqis themselves, whenever they tried to operate in that desert out there, got horribly lost. There were no terrain features, there were no roads. It was impossible to maneuver out there. And the one thing that the Iraqis weren't aware of was, at that time, a brand new technology called the Global Positioning System. It's the first GPS war. 
Satellite technology enables the coalition to cross into Iraq far to the west of the main Iraqi defensive line, setting the stage for an attack on their unprotected right flank. At 1300 hours, the U.S. 7th Corps breaches the sand berm, marking the border between Iraq and Saudi Arabia. We had a, a PSYOPs platoon uh, with us with these 25,000 watt speakers on top of the Humvees. They were there to broadcast surrender appeals, but I had them play Ride of the Valkyries as we were crossing over the berm into Iraq. Kind of cool watching it, but there was nothing there. Our unit was moving, moving to the north and to the east, and and really not hitting a whole lot. I mean, yeah, we did. Uh, we had some reconnaissance units we ran into, but after a couple of shots at us, they would give up. had an Iraqi military that were desperately unhappy and really just wanted to go home. These were not Iraq's first-rate troops. They were mostly Shia conscripts uh, who had been conscripted during the Iran-Iraq War and been kept in the army ever since. Uh, they were desperate to get out of the army, and massive U.S. formations would run into these tiny little Iraqi units. These forces would fire at you you would quickly overwhelm them, and then you would see the white flags come out and you would take large numbers of prisoners. This is what the main coalition armored force encountered on the first day of its climactic swing around the right flank of the Iraqi army. The armor of the Seventh Corps rolls ever deeper into Iraq but at a snail's pace. Cautious force commanders order continual halts. And what they basically did was said, you know what, if we're gonna go due east, we're just gonna use the eastings, all the north-south grid lines, as our methods to control your rate of advance. It was almost like we were crawling. It was, it was not a fast lightning strike. It was very slow. Okay, we'd, we'd move a few clicks and they'd stop us. I'm in a 50-ton vehicle, all this ammunition. I can drive 40-something, 50-something miles an hour, and you're telling me to stop? You know, the enemy's that way. I need to keep going. There was no one forward to see anything to make a personal evaluation. There were no Patton, uh, Rommel, Guderian types who were pulling up next to my tank saying, well there, Major, what do you think? By the end of the second day, the initial surprise and strategic advantage of the flanking maneuver is lost. And the Iraqis realize that the U.S. 7th Corps is about to cut off and surround their forces in Kuwait. It's at that moment that Iraq's general staff actually demonstrates some degree of real competence. They recognize what's going on. And what's more, they realize from the ease with which American formations have been destroying Iraqi formations throughout the theater, that if they are going to stop the American 7th Corps, they're not going to be able to throw some ash and trash, some weak formations in front of it, and allow their better units to escape. Instead, they're going to have to put their best formations in front of those American divisions. The Iraqis make their stand on a defensive line stretching 90 kilometers along the northwestern border of Kuwait. Two infantry and two armored divisions of the Republican Guard will defend the northern half of the line. In the south and directly in the path of the advancing Americans are the cream of Saddam's armored forces. The southern half of the Iraqi Republican Guard line is handled by the Tawakalna Allah Allah division, which means in Arabic, in God we trust. And they see themselves as being great warriors, warriors who defended their nation for eight years and ultimately defeated Iran, the Persian menace. 
and they saw themselves as Republican guards as being the best of the best, Iraq's elite, professional warriors, not conscripts, who were expected to stand and fight and even die so that others may live. We respected them. We, we knew that they were capable of, of some serious destruction, and we knew there were a lot of them. tons and tons of equipment. We respected that. We were real worried about their, their armored vehicles. And of course, our biggest fear was the T-72 tank. The Soviet T-72, known in Iraq as the Lion of Babylon, was the backbone of the Iraqi Armored Corps. Its 125 millimeter main gun can destroy targets over 1,800 meters away. It's a 41-ton monster, plated with armor that is in places 300 millimeters thick. Still, it can reach a speed of 60 kilometers per hour. This makes the T-72 one of the fastest and most lethal heavy tanks in the world. And Saddam has more than 1,000 of them, deployed along the Republican Guard's defensive line. They're supported by hundreds of armored vehicles, including the Soviet-designed BMP. The Republican Guard seems ready to take on all comers. Heading straight for them is the US-led 7th Corps, with hundreds of M2 Bradley fighting vehicles, and well over 1,000 tanks. The most powerful of these is the M1A1 Abrams main battle tank. The Abrams is armed with a 120 millimeter high velocity cannon and protected by composite armor that's as tough as 60 centimeters of pure steel. It's one and a half times heavier than the T-72, but just as fast, making it the most powerful tank on the battlefield. February 25th, these two armored forces are only 14 kilometers apart. The morning of the 26th, very early, uh, perhaps uh, 4 30, 5 o'clock, I can't remember precisely, we suddenly get uh, a change of orders and uh, essentially find and destroy the Republican Guard for all intents and purposes. It got to the point for sort of late morning, early afternoon, where you, you couldn't see more than perhaps uh, 20, 30 yards. All of a sudden, we're about to go into combat against the one real enemy that we had practiced to defeat, and suddenly our visibility is terrible. But the Abrams is up to the job. It has a thermal imaging system that can identify the heat signatures of potential targets, even in the worst conditions. So we're moving in this very limited visibility. And uh, we begin to identify some hot spots. As McMaster's platoon approaches 73 Easting, a line of longitude on the map, he encounters a Tawakalna Division forward outpost. It's manned by infantry with anti-tank guns and rocket-propelled grenades. And it was at this point that we first received fire from the enemy. What we had to realize is we were paralleling a road that ran due east right into the enemy's position. The Battle of 73 Easting, the last great tank battle of the 20th century, is about to begin. February 26, 1991. It's been two days since the US-led international coalition invades southern Iraq in an attempt to outflank Iraqi forces and drive them out of nearby Kuwait. In response, the Iraqis establish a defensive screen, deploying five divisions of Saddam Hussein's elite Republican Guard, including the fully mechanized Tawakalna Division.
Just west of the map reference 73 Easting, the U.S. 2nd Armored Cavalry to spearhead the coalition advance makes contact with the Republican Guard. And it was at this point we first received fire from, from the enemy. And then pull up our, our nine tanks online, all of us oriented on this village. I give this troop fire command. Village, direct front, frontal, one round heat at my command, ready report, which means everybody load a heat round, look at that village, pick out your aim points on, on the enemy positions, and when they're ready, we're gonna fire nine simultaneous main gun rounds at the center. I fire one round before that to mark center with a tank heat round. Green says ready, white says ready. I say fire, nine tank main gun rounds impact simultaneously. Now, we get the word, continue your move to the east. And it's at that point I just get this gut feeling, you know. I get this feeling that we're about to make contact with, with you know, with a defending enemy force. And I make the decision to go into a tank's lead formation. That means positioning the Abrams tanks in a rolling wedge with the more vulnerable Bradley fighting vehicles tucked in behind for protection. This formation places McMaster's big guns forward, ready for whatever lies ahead. So my tank comes up over that crest. And again, remember, it's a sandstorm, right? You can't see very far, but it is if the sandstorm just lifted. I mean, as soon as we came over that ridge, it was some weird environmental factor, but it was like a curtain lifted. And what I was confronted with was the enemy defensive position. They were deployed in a reverse slope position, which is designed to minimize the amount of time and the amount of distance that an attacking force actually has before it can start to fire on the defenders. Unfortunately, they didn't count on the sophisticated optics and fire control systems of the US M1 tanks, which made their thinking entirely obsolete. I could see eight enemy tanks in defensive positions, and I said, fire, fire, Sabo which means we had a heat round in, and it means the next round going in that gun is gonna be a Sabo tank, you know, armor defeating round. The Abrams tank carries two types of high velocity ammunition. The Sabo, an armor piercing dart made with high density depleted uranium, and the high explosive anti-tank round, a shaped charge projectile which can bore through heavy armor. And we engage that first tank with a heat round. That fireball blows the tank commander out of that tank. And then ultimately there's a secondary explosion that blows the turret off that tank. My gunner traverses left, hits the other tank. We're able to destroy three tanks as our tank hits the first leading edge of the minefield. I looked to the right and I saw what looked like explosions to the left uh, front of uh, McMaster's tank. And I couldn't tell if these were mines uh, or artillery fire again. And my gunner, uh, Dewey Jones, pipes up and says, holy sh look at this. I dropped down inside, I looked through my commander's sight, and I said, oh yeah, I, you know, I was <laughs> finally impressed with the enemy. Here were, you know, rows, literally 10, 15 tanks spread right across to the front, and you could see that these tank guns were moving. And I imagine, since these were manual T-72s, the poor Republican Guard was in there <laughs> busily cranking to get the guns around towards us. Then all of a sudden, my tank went into a minefield. And this thing rocked the 70-ton tank. A fireball went over it, knocked me down to the turret floor. And uh, fortunately, my driver was very tough-minded. So what the hell was that? And I said, don't worry about it, keep driving. 
As we were coming out of the minefield, we had a couple of tanks to our front. It was, sir, I got tanks to my front. And I'm looking at the damn tank that we're about to take under fire. And the gunner has said, sir, can I shoot? Can I fire? I said, for God's sake, shoot! <laughs> swung to the next wind and fired. And in the meantime, I could see that Eagle Troop was taking uh, enormous numbers of vehicles under fire. Initially, there was a great deal of disorientation on the Iraqi side because they just assumed that this couldn't be American tanks attacking them. It had to be aircraft. after they figured it out. They still had difficulty getting into their vehicle in time because they didn't realize how quickly the Americans were closing on them. American armored forces would charge, using speed to simply try to disorient the Iraqis, and it worked. The Iraqis could not imagine armored forces this big, this powerful, moving at them as fast as they were. It's a tactic developed by General Erwin Rommel, the great World War II German tank commander. And the M1A1 Abrams is ideally suited for this kind of warfare. The gun stays right on target. It has a geostabilized system. And um, I mean, you can, you can be moving out at you know, 40, 50 kilometers an hour, going over bumps and firing. shock effect of a seven-ton machine hurtling at you. I think this is the blow from which the enemy could never really recover. We were now on top of their command post, and we entered their reserve position. And in just in like typical Soviet doctrine, they had put their tank reserve like a coil. But we moved too fast. They couldn't get out of their coil in time. They were just starting their engines. I looked at an enemy tank commander, looked over his shoulder at me. I could see the expression on his face, and, and we engaged that tank at very close range. And you couldn't tell the difference between the enemy tank being hit and our gun going off, and just big hunks of metal, blue sparks arced right back over our heads. And then the rest of our tanks came up, and we destroyed these tanks in their assembly area. you know, had set up a pretty sound defense. I mean, it was a reverse slope defense. It had a reserve. It had a counterattack plan. It had a minefield to disrupt our movement. But the fatal flaw was that we gained surprise over them. Despite the Iraqis' best efforts, Eagle Troop overwhelms the position, killing hundreds of Iraqis and destroying more than 50 tanks and armored vehicles. It's the opening round in a furious tank battle that will soon be fought across a much larger front. Eight kilometers to the north, the second armored cavalry's ghost troop slowly makes its way through the blinding sandstorm. In the reduced visibility, they have lost touch with Eagle Troop. Ghost Troop's commander sends two lightly armored Bradley reconnaissance vehicles to reestablish contact. I tell the driver to start slowing down because I'm starting to see these little objects. But what could they be? I mean, you're in the middle of the desert. So I'm immediately thinking, well, they're vehicles. But my number one concern, of course, is I'm going to go link up with Eagle. That's, maybe that's Eagle. Maybe that's not. And I see all these people emerging out of nowhere out of the ground. And then you see, like, this diesel plume. And then immediately followed by this BMF giant T-72 tank backing up out of the hole. Ah, that must be enemy. I'm seeing a lot of activity. Turrets start moving, and I'm like, oh, where is Eagle Troop? February 26, 1991, 1,600 hours. 
Eagle and Ghost troops of the 2nd U.S. Armored Cavalry have become separated in a sandstorm. Two Bradley fighting vehicles from Ghost Troop have been dispatched to re-establish visual contact between the two tank units. But they run into a platoon of Iraqi T-72 tanks. So I tell the driver to pull up to this little mound. And as soon as he comes to a stop, uh, he says, tank front. Roger, got it, thanks. And uh, he goes, no, no, there's a tank to our immediate front. He goes, I see it. No, no, you don't understand. There's a tank to our front. And I just get up, push myself out of that turret, and I look down, and I go, I'll be damned. Well, what happened is I didn't realize the little mound of dirt that I told him to pull up front was a T-72. I just grabbed the uh, commander's auto ride, max deflect the 25 millimeter cannon. And then I said, you know, we're scouts. We don't go toe to toe with tanks. We need to back up a little. Well, now I'm seeing all these tanks, a lot of activity. And the turrets start moving, and, and I'm like, oh, shit. where is Eagle Troop? <laughs> So I'm backing up, I'm backing up. Well, what, where am I gonna go to? Okay, Sergeant Wonder, I raised the missile. So I lay him onto this T-72 that's showing me this beautiful, bright profile. Sergeant Wonder, gunner, missile tank is right to our front. And you know, I, I, I can't identify, this is, this, this could be Eagle Troop. And I'm just like, how could you miss? It's bigger than a barn door. What do you mean you can't see this? So I said, go clear channel. He goes, flips over, takes it off thermals. Identify T-72 tank. It's a fire. The Tome missile is the Bradley's most powerful and accurate weapon. It's guided by wires, enabling the gunner to steer it to the target, even at ranges of up to 3,000 meters. Now I realize there's like eight of them all in this immediate vicinity. At this time, I'm thinking, OK, these guys all know that I'm here, and they're probably a little pissed off about it. So I go, gunner, missile tank, he has identified. And I say, five. And I see this missile come out from the launcher, go just past my gun tube, fall to the desert floor. I'm like, hmm. Mm -hmm. um, uh, misfire, misfire. And at that time, my wingman opens up a missile, blows the heck out of this thing that was turning the turret on. Then it occurred to me, we both have shot both our missiles. And we both have to our front at least eight T-72 tanks. Meriwether says, hey, I need to do a reload drill. So I said, Roger that, we got you covered. And I told Sergeant Wonder, all right, whatever we do, we're going to keep firing and firing until we can't fire no more. And he starts firing 25 millimeter cannon into the cell. And it's bouncing off the turret. And my gunner, he said, sir, it's bouncing off. It's bouncing off. You know, we're just pissing it off. And my intent was, look, better us than my wingman who's standing there, you know, basically naked. I'm thinking, well, I wonder how long it's going to take that gunner and commander to shoot me while I'm sitting there pinking it with a 25 millimeter cannon. The M2 Bradley is a reconnaissance vehicle designed for mobility rather than heavy combat. It is equipped with a 25 millimeter main cannon capable of firing high explosive rounds. But to increase its speed and range, it is protected by just 25 millimeters of armor plating. The Bradley is no match for the powerful T-72. Then at that time, my wingman reported up. Almost instantaneously, he serviced that tank with a missile. Probably saved my life. So out of the sandstorm and 
lot of smoke now on the battle here. Emerged some a couple of Eagle Troop rallies. Slowly approached me from the right. And he pulls up next to me and he screams at the top of his lungs, there's tanks over there. <laughs> I go, I know. In just minutes, Haynes and his wingman destroy no fewer than five T-72s. But this is just one strong point in an Iraqi defensive line stretching across a 90-kilometer front that is in places 10 kilometers deep. To the north, Ghost Troop continues through the sandstorm, unaware they are moments away from contact with the main line of Iraqi defense. We're slowly moving forward. And when, I'm, when I mean slowly, I mean about as fast as a man can walk. And when you're in a tank, you've got track pads. We were going slow enough where you could actually feel the individual track pads hitting the ground. We get a uh, little bit, little bit of a, uh, a wind shift, and we can see something out in front of us. We saw heads pop out, and we think what it was, they were in a bunker, and they felt the movement of the armored vehicle. is barely recognizable because it's cold. But when the, the bodies come out of it, they're white hot. They're glowing hot. They're so white on your, on your background. And so they're running from one bump to another. But I can figure out if they're coming out of something, running to something, that's probably a vehicle. When the telecom soldiers finally figure out that there is a major attack on them, they leap to their tanks, they get in their tanks and their armored fighting vehicles, and they fight back as best they can. The problem that they have to begin with is that the Americans are shooting at them at ranges at which they can't possibly fire back. I told the gunner to shoot the vehicle. Immediately followed just a second or so later by a uh, heat round from Ghost 6. We shot it, and this thing exploded. And the next thing I know, you know, um, my other tank platoons have seen similar things to what I was seeing, and they started engaging. Now you've got the dark, oily, black smoke mixed in from the uh, vehicle that's just destroyed that is hot. You can see people and things moving behind it. So I called my troop commander and told him, hey, sir, there's something past that smoke. That wasn't a single vehicle. I want permission to, to move up and poke my nose through the smoke. And I said, yeah, OK, Roger, makes sense. So these four tanks of Andes just disappear through the black smoke. And then it is just absolute Armageddon. I can see rounds being fired, the whole, I don't know whether it's friendly, I don't know whether, you know, they're being attacked. And I'm trying to raise Andy on the net. And, you know, as I'm watching this, it's like, okay, Captain, what are you gonna do now? February 26, 1991. The remote desert of southern Iraq erupts in a fierce tank battle between the U.S. 2nd Armored Cavalry and the Tawakalna Mechanized Division of the Iraqi Republican Guard. Captain H.R. McMaster, the men of Eagle Troop, have destroyed an entire company of Iraqi T-72 tanks. Now, Lieutenant Andy Kilgore and Ghost Troop are about to experience their own baptism of fire. At that time, 7th Corps was four M1 Abram tanks. There was 110,000 soldiers behind me. There was nobody in front of me. I poked through the smoke, we realized that we had about a company defense spread out in front of us. He was in there. He was in their assembly area. 
I mean, he was in and amongst these guys. I mean, he basically, it's like, you know, he opened, opened the front door and just started shooting. The T-72 is a pretty good tank for when it is developed, but it is developed in the 1970s. It's got good armor, but it's very much outclassed by the M1 Abrams tank which is its superior in every imaginable category. Its armor can take anything that the T-72 has to throw at it, whereas the T-72 gets sliced open uh, like a, a hot knife going through butter. The Soviets had a different theory on storage of ammo than the Americans. They've got the ammo basically stored around their hull. So if you make the ammo explode on a T-72 or any Russian tank, all that explosive force is funneled up through the turret. Ghost Troop fires repeatedly. until the Iraqi tank company is all but destroyed. But the men of the Tawakalna division won't give up. They saw themselves as being the best of the best, Iraq's elite. They manned their positions, they manned their vehicles, they fought back hard, they didn't surrender, and they died fighting. In many cases, the Americans had to kill every single member in an Iraqi squad or a platoon to get these guys to stop fighting. And I'm looking over, and I can see past my wingman to my platoon sergeant. And I see an Iraqi jump up in front of him with an RPG. Iraqi is probably 50 meters in front of the tank. He slewed the gun onto the target. The gunner very excited to see a guy pointing an RPG straight at him. Instead of flipping the coax, he just pulls the trigger. He hit him what looked to me about center mass with a heat round. 120 millimeter projectile about like that in the center of the guy's chest. It looked like he imploded. The guy's body's just picked up and thrown away like a leaf. In just a few minutes, Lieutenant Kilgore's platoon kills dozens of Iraqis and destroys four tanks and nine armored vehicles. When I finally destroyed all the vehicles that we could see, I got back up on a troop net, called in a spot report to the troop commander, who was not very happy with Lieutenant Kilgore at that time, since I had been engagement for a few minutes and not reporting. I said, you ever pull any stuff like that? I said, I'll, I'll, you know, I'll put a bullet in you myself. Um, but as it turned out, you know, in hindsight, uh, that was the absolute right thing to do, move forward that smoke, because basically he took the initiative away from the enemy. Despite heavy losses, the Iraqis won't quit and launch a counterattack in an attempt to halt Ghost Troop's advance. We got to the point where we were on 73 Easting, where we started engaging. We're moving, and I'm, I'm so intent on what's going on. I'm in the moment, and all of a sudden, I get thrown to the ground. I get thrown to the turret of my vehicle, and I'm like, what the hell just happened? And what I look, at, I look up at my gunner, and he's yelling at me, and I can't hear him because I have a headset on. And, and I finally get him on the intercom. Why did you do that? And he, and he says, sir, there are artillery rounds landing right next to our vehicle, and you didn't even notice it. You were sticking your head all the way out of the vehicle. He said, you didn't see those rounds? I said, I had no idea that was happening. Because I was so focused on what was happening on the radio, what was going on with all the other things. That's how intense it is. You're just, just go, go, go. saw that we were attacking from their flank, so they tried to, to move out and, and come around on our flank. What, what that ended up doing was that gave us a bunch of silhouettes moving across our flank. And the crazy thing is that when we go to gunnery, 
we practice with moving targets to look just like that. When that occurred, what I did is I scrambled two tanks, give them to the scalp platoon, and the scalp platoon would give two, two Bradleys and give it to the tank platoon. By scrambling Bradley's and Abrams' tanks in combined fighting units, Sartiano creates a lethal see and shoot combination. The Bradley's, with their superior targeting systems, pinpoint targets for the tanks, which then open fire with their high-velocity 120-millimeter guns, able to unleash a deadly accurate round every four seconds. You imagine putting something that's about as round as a grapefruit two miles away onto something that's as big as, uh, you know, a little bigger than a van. Right, that, that's unbelievable. We had tanks shooting over two miles and getting the hits. It was absolutely amazing. All of a sudden, I remember it was Jeff Garwick said, Sergeant Muller has been hit. And all of a sudden, the whole troop net just went silent. February 26, 1991. The U.S. 2nd Armored Cavalry's Eagle and Ghost Troops have dealt a crushing blow to the Tawakalma Mechanized Division. But just as it seems they will emerge from the battle unscathed, one of Ghost Troops' Bradley fighting vehicles takes a direct hit. We notice at 1-6, which is on the extreme right of the scout platoon to our left, he's pulled up on just a little bit of a rise. He was probably hit by one of the vehicles that we had shot. because I don't think there was anything left out there unengaged. So I'm probably willing to bet that that BMP had been shot with the sable round, abandoned, because it didn't explode and burn, people got back in it. The BMP is a lightly armored fighting vehicle like the Bradley. A high velocity Sabo round might tear right through it, leaving it still operational. Armed with a 76 millimeter semi-automatic cannon, the BMP has more than enough firepower to penetrate a Bradley. Staff Sergeant Chaffee, the Bradley commander, he said that Andy turned and looked at him and said, what the f was that? About that time, the second round hit and decapitated Sergeant Muller. Really hurt morale of the troop to know that, that uh, Sergeant Muller died. The whole troop was able to basically rally uh, around, around the situation. You know, oh, one of our guys just got hit, but I got a job to do. This fight is not over. You're in the middle of it. You can't worry about this guy. You got to keep going. The Battle of 73 Easting is all over in just 90 minutes. American casualties are remarkably light, one killed and 12 wounded. For the Iraqis, however, the toll is enormous. The Tawakalna was wiped out in the fighting against the U.S. 7th Corps. Thousands of members of the Tawakalna Division were killed. They started out the battle with about 200 tanks, and barely two dozen were able to pull back off of it later on. You know, after the attack, we ran out and, uh, and then captured uh, some additional enemy prisoners. We put them in the back of our squadron tactical command post, Bradley. And as they closed the turret shield door, there was a picture of Erwin Rommel who you know, we had admired and, and sort of patterned ourselves after in terms of his tactics. So this uh, brigade commander 
says in perfect English, you know, why do you have a picture of your World War II adversary in your, in your Bradley? And one of our privates in the back of the Bradley said, listen, why don't you just shut the hell up? If you'd read a little bit more about Rommel, you wouldn't be sitting in the back of my track. The reason for not only the American victory, but also the overwhelming nature of that victory lay in the fact that the United States held pretty much every single advantage over Iraq that you could imagine. But there was the stand of the Tawakalna and several other divisions of the Republican Guard that slowed down the American advance. It bought time for other Iraqi units to retreat out of the Kuwaiti theater. It's a great tragedy because it set the stage for the intervention in 2003. It was the survival of the Republican Guard that ultimately preserves the Saddam Hussein regime. He might have fallen right then and there in 1991 and saved the Iraqis and the United States and the entire Middle East another bloody war.